let's stand if we could. Let's stand together in the name of Jesus. Let's uh, kind of start this auspiciously with uh, Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through 15. Somewhat is said that the entire book of Revelation could be summarized as the ultimate defeat of evil in the victory of Jesus. The ultimate defeat of evil in the victory of Jesus. That is a, in a, a descent of the power of darkness into the pit of hell. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ ascending into heavenly glory as the bright morning star that he is. But there is a battle for this title, if you will. Jesus is clearly the victor. There's never any doubt. It's not even a dualism. The, the deed is done. Jesus is already the victor, to be sure. But we must choose. We must decide whether to follow the prideful one in his descent into the abyss, or do we follow Jesus in his ascension? The beauty of that. But here we see a picture of the one who deceived the nations. And uh, the Latin word Lucifer is here. If you had a Latin text in front of you, this is how it goes. But it's uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. It's in the Latin Vulgate text, Jerome translated that as Lucifer. How you have fallen, O Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. And now let's fast forward as we jump into this war. We saw the Wonder Woman <laughs> movie, and we just really enjoyed it. Wonder Woman says, show me the war. Show me the war. Show me the battle. And boom, she takes off for the battlefront. <laughs> it just, that works for me. It might not work for you, but it just works for me. <laughs> show me the battle. It's this beautiful picture of Jesus. Incredible picture. This is Revelation chapter 1. Verse 7, Revelation 1, 7. Look, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. And then here is Yeshua saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty then when John on the island of Patmos sees him in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Thank you, Jesus. And then perhaps one of the greatest I am statements, the last one in the Bible, and if we understand Revelation as being written last in the flow of the books of the uh, New Testament, we read Jesus again saying in verse 13 of Revelation 22, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And then verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give to you this testimony for the churches. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. For I am the root and the offspring of David, and I am the bright morning 
star. The ascent of Jesus to the right hand of God, not to dethrone God or not to impeach him, but to join hands with him, to join arms together and say, we are one. I and the Father are one, Jesus says. So, Lord, we humble our hearts before you. Jesus, we want to join with you. Lord, we want to break our allegiance with the enemy. We want to break our allegiance with Satan, with Lucifer, the one who wanted to descend above the stars of God, the messengers of God. We want to break that allegiance that is so deep in our bloodstream and say yes to you, Jesus. And when the enemy comes and tries to connive us or manipulate us into serving him and doing it his way, we will say, it is written, worship and serve the Lord only. And Lord, strip us of that ego, ego, egocentricity. For your word says, I hate pride and I hate arrogance. Pride only breeds quarrels. Pride goes before destruction. A man's pride brings him low, the scripture says. Lord, empower us in this new series, Abba Father. Lord, I, I, I am nowhere near qualified to teach from this. But Lord, empower us and we will give you the credit and we will give you the glory. In Jesus' precious name, everyone said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Abba Father. You can just relax and I love studying the founding fathers of our nation. Dory and I were recently in awe when we were at the Museum of Fine Arts to see the big picture of George Washington. How many of you were there at the, uh, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts and see this gargantuan life size? It's about as large as that wall of Washington crossing the Delaware. It's an amazing, inspirational uh, scene. But John Adams, in a letter to... Thomas Jefferson wrote, my friend, you and I have lived in serious times. And brothers and sisters, you and I are living in serious times. And I just trust and pray that I, that we won't miss it. We are living in serious times and there's a lot of temporal concerns that we can be caught up with. But brothers and sisters, eternity is knocking at the door. Eternity is knocking at the door. When I go and visit, when Dory and I go and visit Leon Gilman, there he is, 100 years old and counting, and eternity is knocking at my door. Leon is fearless. He has no fear of life. He has no fear of death. He's a little bit irritated when the food isn't right, and he's a little bit irritated at the loss of privacy in a few other matters. And how many of you would understand? But he is fearless when it comes to life and death realities. And eternity is knocking at the door. And it helps me to see him. God speaks to me through Leon Gilman. He's a prophetic sign. When someone reaches 100 years old, just like Abraham, he's a prophetic sign. And we need to be alert to that reality. God's going to take him home, and I believe his passing is going to be very smooth, very, very simple. But brothers and sisters, we live in serious times. Look at the book of Revelation, the uh, book of uh, Romans, for instance. The New Testament writers were pregnant, if you will, with this deep sense of the significance of the moment, the significance of the time. They were not caught up in temporal comforts and realities, but they were caught up with the eternal significance of what was going on now. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Paul had this vision of the significance of the day in which he was living in. And we, we should underline these things. The first century church lived with a deep sense of the imminent return of Jesus. There's no question they thought that Jesus was coming in their day, in their time. 
Every generation that it's going to really be of value to the Lord has to understand and realize that the coming of the Lord perhaps is knocking on the door right now. And we should look honestly at the New Testament text and see that this is the reality. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The morning star has appeared. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then the urgency for simple behavior. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, wasting your resources, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of sarx, the Bible calls it. The Greek word sarx is usually translated.